Bell. I am an artist. And I'm also an artist who's had a stroke two years ago. So those are the two things that feature right now in my life. Um, trying as hard as I can to get back to what used to be my normal life. Although I'm slowly learning that there is a new normal out there. And I'm not quite sure what it looks like because it does change very often, fairly often. Um, I've been an artist for most of my life. I started off doing many other things. I wound up working in an office that was above a quite a well-known art gallery in Vancouver. So I would spend my, my uh, breaks, my lunch breaks, going in and checking out the new work or the work that had been out there for a while. And that was, that was pretty exciting. So I thought, well, I can need a little bit more of this. The taste is not just quite enough. I did eventually wind up becoming a part-time and then full-time student at Emily Carr. And um, one thing led to another. I wound up going to UVic for a master's degree. And from there on, I've just been working on various projects. Some of them are, uh, many of them are materials that come from the industrial sector. So I've used that. I'm also interested in the interaction between uh, the built environment and what we tend to call the natural environment. And what's interesting to me is how those two, one plays into, into the other, or they play against one another. And a lot of my earlier work in particular reflected that. One of the things that's helped me through this long journey is the fact that I can fall back on making art. Um, mind you, that has changed. I used to make much larger installations, room size. I think the last exhibition I had of, uh, of one of my tape drawings, this space encompassed an entire room and um, it took four days of very intense work and months of planning to create it. Uh, needless to say that I'm not up to that anymore. Um, but that's okay because it's given me a chance to work with some of the ideas that come up as I create the installation. Um, the installation happens fairly quickly, uh, as I said, in four days time. So that doesn't really give me a chance to stand back and look at what the work is as it's emerging. I pretty well have to believe that it's going to go as I expected or as I planned. And you know, there are occasional things that are unexpected, but that's kind of the way it works. Things have changed a bit. So now I'm taking some of the ideas that I didn't have a chance to work out in the very contracted space of a four day installation. And they have become the work that you see behind me, which are tape drawings and they are mixed with various bits of whatever materials I have at hand or whatever materials allow me to get the textures and the uh, colors I want. It was interesting to, to me to work with a very limited material, for instance, using colored masking tape, because it defines, it gives you certain parameters. So it's kind of like, if you're open to whatever, you're playing a game without rules. But if you've got some rules and you have some walls to bounce again, and you can go, well, no, I'm not gonna go down this path because that's not open to me. Um, so the business of having some strictures is really interesting because you have to learn how to work within them. And I'm sure you've had this experience sometimes when you think, oh, there just isn't enough space or there isn't enough imagination or there isn't enough place to go. If you sit with it long enough, it will open up. And that's when it gets really exciting because in a certain way, the piece starts to, it has its own little trajectory that it's traveling along. And if you travel along at the right speed, it, it becomes something that you're really interested in. It feeds your curiosity. Um, sometimes not, that's just the way it is. But very often it is. And that makes it quite, uh, quite engaging.
Well, I must say my art started in the middle, well, not in the middle. My art uh, continued, I continued to work on it as I had a stroke. And the irony of it is I had a stroke working in the studio. Um, it came right out of the blue. I had no idea what was going on. I just knew that suddenly I was on the floor and I could not get up. I was puzzled. I lay on the floor for a while. My husband wasn't, he wasn't within texting or phoning distance. And I was quite concerned about what am I gonna do now? So I lay on the ground for a bit and uh, finally I was able to reach my phone and I can't remember if I called him or texted him, but um, we were close enough at that point that he could come and try and figure out what was going on. They were a wonderful team through Lionsgate Hospital, an entire battery of uh, people who were on side to try to help you get better and try to figure out what it is, especially after the initial ten intensity of, my goodness, what's happened? How am I gonna get out of this? What is it gonna take? How long is it gonna take? All of those questions that are simply there after you have a stroke. It, ha it works on both, both sides. How did my art, how was, was my art making influence? And how did my art making influence my recovery? Um, I don't know how I would have managed to find that kind of focus in something else in my life if I didn't make art. I suppose I would have found something, but it was there, it was who I am, what I've been doing. And of course, that was my big anxiety was, could I continue to do this? What would it be like? So I pushed a lot in terms of finding a way of dealing with this, well, is it fair to say a new person? Certainly someone who has a different take on art making and um, art than pri pri previously. So it's also taught me that I need to loosen up in some areas, uh, that I don't have everything under control. And I think in a lot of ways, I mean, that's a huge challenge for, for me because I like to be in control, but also to be able to let go a little bit and to allow there to be questions and things that are unresolved or uncertain and to understand that it's part of a long learning process. And I think that's what the stroke has given me and what I'm responding to is um, a greater understanding of a long, slow process and how that works and the patience that it takes and some of the curiosity that it takes to go there. We got this, uh, the local newspaper had this great um, bold headline. And the headline was, do, got, do nothing, go nowhere and stay home. And that shut down things immediately. So um, it was still cold. It was just the 16th of March. We had heard about COVID being around and we thought, well, a couple of weeks. Well, seven months later, things have changed quite a bit. Um, I was, as everyone was, stuck at home, but I did have a studio that still was in the process of becoming a more comfortable space, but nevertheless, it was a place to work in. And at that time, I think perhaps a little less than a month later, um, I got an email from or a telephone call from a friend and we were just chatting about, well, what is it that you're doing? And she said, well, I'm part of a drawing exchange, a drawing circle. And she said, what do you think? Are you interested? I said, well, I'm not sure because I haven't been doing much drawing in the last few years at all. So uh, I sent them a drawing and they said, oh, for goodness sakes, yeah, come on, let's be part of the circle. And it was just this crazy drawing that I had done um, in the studio thinking about COVID. And I was extremely upset about COVID because my father and stepmom uh, lived in a long-term care facility in Ontario. And 
fairly early on, they had discovered COVID in the home. Um, my father tested negative. My stepmom, on the other hand, tested positive, but she had no apparent symptoms. Um, her daughter and I would, would email or text about how things were going. Of course, no one could go in, no one could go out. So we largely depended on the Facebook page of the, of the home to have an update on, on patients. They asked people not to call or email um, because they were so overwhelmed with trying to deal with this totally new disease. My father was confined to a wheelchair and he was never a patient man. And he was also a very ambitious man. And although he had been told time after time that he needed to ask for assistance when he needed to transfer from wheelchair or bed, vice versa, he either forgot, he also suffered from uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, and he would often try to do that transfer himself. So of course we were all upset about it because we knew that one of these days he would fall. And sure enough, he fell, and he had done many times before, but this time he fell hard and he broke his hip. They rushed him off to the hospital and they repaired his hip in no time at all. I spoke to the surgeon and things seemed to be going well. He went into the hospital, he had tested negative for COVID. Uh, he was discharged with a negative um, reading and taken back to the home. And then a few days later, I got an early morning, morning, morning phone call, which of course we know is never a good sign. Apparently when the um, orderlies went in to wake him, he was not responsive. So they checked his vital signs and it was pretty quickly obvious that he had had a stroke. Um, there was nothing they could do and they just left him be and within a few hours he died. Uh, six weeks later, my stepmom died. Uh, her COVID symptoms never really became particularly um, acute but she did need a respirator and eventually it worked its way into her lungs. And although they sent her to the hospital, uh, it was far too late. There was nothing they could do. So I lost both of them. And of course they were in Ontario. I'm here, no one could get on a plane. Uh, my brother lives in Edmonton and there was nothing I could do. And I was very fortunate that my um, stepmom's daughter don't know what makes us that, what relationship we have, but um, they've always been very helpful, she and her husband, and they stepped in and did a lot of the kinds of things that had to be done by hands-on. Um, that was an incredible blow, and I was back into a long, slow panic, one that I had been in since 2016 when my father was diagnosed with dementia, Alzheimer's, um, as well as having his other physical mobility issues. Um, so I just went into the studio and I drew. I couldn't think of anything else to do to keep me focused and to keep the panic at bay. Um, so I drew and I drew and I drew and I drew. And out of that work, um, I mean, I was drawing a band. Uh, there were mushrooms out in the spring. I was drawing mushrooms. There were, um, uh, fox gloves out. I was drawing fox gloves. There were snails out. I was drawing snails. I was drawing slugs, whatever. And after a while, um, I thought, well, what it would be, what would it be like to, instead of doing these random drawings, to kind of give them a little structure. So I started playing with, I had a little mannequin in the studio. I started making drawings of the mannequin in various poses. And then I started thinking about the composition of a piece and what would it be like if I put a little black box in it? And that blocks, black box in a lot of ways was, it was metaphoric in the sense of here we are in COVID. We don't know if we're going forward. We don't know how hard this is going to hit, how many people we're going to lose. Um, of course, there were so many people who were stuck indoors in very confined spaces, um, in cities where much, who were suffering much more greatly than we had so far in Canada. 
So there was a lot of people being just confined to their very small apartments. And I was very curious about how that would work in terms of representation of the little black box. So I started to play with the idea, are we in, are we out? Are we looking at this work? Are we looking at the outside from the inside? And this little, little mannequin started to be in, in uh, um, you see, it, the mannequin became a, um, a stand-in for not only us physically, but our psychic spaces. And that to me got more and more interesting the more and more I drew. So I've, I think I'm up to about 18 of them now. Um, so now I'm gonna take you over and I'm gonna show you some of these drawings. There's one side of them, and I'm just going to rotate it so you can see them all. I just wanted to say, um, there's not that much that really to say about each one individually. Um, I think, as you've just said, it's marvelous to see them together because they do form a narrative which is, is circular in the sense that we never know from day to day if we're getting um if things are getting better if we are following the uh, guidelines and the result is as we hoped you know the last few days have really been heartening uh, i think with the new administration in the united states they are going to start to take this disease much more seriously so perhaps they will put all of that wonderful energy into finding uh, a vaccine and also finding a way of, of, of dealing with, with the disease um, as it should have been. So um, that kind of up and down is reflected in, in the works. The way I position the little black box, um, for instance, here, now let's see if you can see. If you can see. Okay, um, this one here, clearly there's a, there's a figure reaching out. And usually in the drawings, when part of the figure goes out of the box, it becomes ghost-like. And my sense is that we have li are living part of a ghostly or ghost-like existence because we can't um, live the lives we're used to living and we don't know what's what that life that we are coming into is going to look like. We just know that's not going to be like it was in the past. Um, this one is entirely in, in the box. Um, and I get the sense of voyeurism out of this. Um, the idea that we are, are looking out or looking back or looking in on a life that is not open to us, is forbidden for the moment. And this one here. Is very much about the feeling of wanting, wanting to be out of this. Uh, the frustrations we have because we cannot get back to jobs, we can't get to family, we can't do most of the things that we want to do. And there doesn't seem to be a time limit on it. So that frustration is constant. And there's a lot of pushing in and out of the space in the figure and uh, trying to reach for something that there is nothing in the ground, in the background. So all that we're seeing and, reach, and the figures are reaching for is um, an ambiguous space. So there you are, Art 101. <laughs> These two works are from a series called Sampler. Um, and I'm talking about them now because uh, they're probably gonna have an influence on the work that I'm going to, uh, that I'm starting to do now. Um, I enjoy the drawing, but it's a very strict discipline. And I do like playing with materials. I mean, I come from a sculpture background and, and materials has always been the thing that's piqued my curiosity and has driven a lot of my, my uh, creativity um, in terms of, you know, kind of a puzzle solving thing. 
So when I had a chance to look at some of the collages again, uh, there are some bits and pieces, as every artist has, is things that you've started off and, you know, it's not really going to go where you want. So you stick it in a pile. So with the collages, I have a chance to explore the kinds of things in perhaps larger works that really, uh, I think, God, I like that. That's, that's really cool. So I start to put them together and sometimes they, they become something larger and sometimes they stay as pieces from, and from the sampler series, I was thinking about the idea of sampling. Sampling not only um, as we sample music, but there is, there is an old tradition of young girls being um, taught embroidery and the sewing arts and they would create samplers, which was a very much a 19th century thing that we would always find on a wall in most homes. The young girl had created a sampler so that she is proving herself as, pos as, as a possibly good wife because she knows how to sew. <laughs> when did you ever last sew anything by hand? I mean, really. <laughs> um, and there's an exhibition coming up in 2022. Uh, there are five of us artists who um, we've been meeting as a group for a couple of years. Um, not necessarily because we're artists, just because we happen, to, we, are, we are linked in various ways. And uh, we decided at one point that the meetings were fine, but we wanted to do something more, which was going to be an exhibition. And um, we decided, we thought about what are we going to do? And someone came to the meeting with a little article from a newspaper. It was called, the title of the article was, I wanted to go into space, but I didn't have anything to wear, which has become the title of the exhibition. And what it centers on is the limitations of women, uh, particularly in the STEM area of, of um, uh, research and education and how they have been left behind, uh, often by invisible choices, uh, simply uh, often simply by there being silence or no room for them. And the example, um, this, this article was a review of a book called Invisible Women. And it was a review of the data around women's invisibility. I believe that it ties into the Unruly, the Unruly Bodies series that I started working on years ago. And I feel is still, it still has a place to go and I'm curious about exploring that. And now that I've been drawing again, uh, will I use some drawing? Um, will I use collage? What's the size of the pieces? Are they going to be more object-like? So there's a whole host of questions there. And I do have a little more than a year to explore it, but I'm already thinking, oh, that's not quite enough time. But of course, I'll make do. Maybe I'll just talk about the things that have been the greatest challenge for me because I, I was very fortunate. I was very mildly affected. Although it was dramatic initially, I, was, I fell down, couldn't get up and had to crawl and so on. Um, but I recovered fairly quickly. I was soon able to shed uh, the wheelchair and the walker and the cane. Um, my walking abilities came back fairly quickly. I did quite a bit of physiotherapy. I also have a background in dance. And so I, I understand my body somatically and I continue to dance. In fact, just before we were shut down by COVID, I was at a dance workshop in Vancouver and it was, it was wonderful. It was a three day, two or three day workshop. And it was four, four hours of dancing a day, which I was really unclear whether or not I could do that. But I went in with the idea that I'll hang in there as long as I can. I didn't really want to share the fact that I'd had a stroke with the dance community because then they treat you as if you're made of glass. And I'm not made of glass. I just, parts of me just didn't work very well for a while. Um, so I would say if there's something that you're passionate about doing, find a way to do it, even if it's just in a small way. Um, and it's not gonna happen overnight. I think patience is the big thing, patience with yourself. Um, I also find that I still have to explain to people because I 
don't show much sign of stroke, that things are different. Um, people want to be sympathetic or they want you to feel better. So they say, well, you know, we're all aging and it's true, but I also understand that I know that it's not, you can tell the difference. So I would say to others, don't let the outside noise divert you from, from the path that you have to tread right now. Get all the therapy that you can get. Um, read some, but not too much. Um, and just really kind of believe that you're going to get somewhere. Uh, it won't be the same place that you were before. You will not be the same person. Um, but at our core, we're not going to change. So the kinds of dreams and, and hopes that we've had, they're just as valid now. Not really, except for the fact that it's been, it's been a tough journey, it's been a frightening journey, but it's also been, I learned so much about myself. Some of the stuff I didn't want to learn. <laughs> Learned. I was like, oh no, am I really that way? I was frightened by some of uh, my behaviors. I know that it comes with any kind of brain interruption, but I felt very badly that my poor husband wound up being a whipping post for the smallest irritations I had. I'm also realizing that there are limitations, that there are certain environments that I do better in. I'm much happier um, and calmer when I'm outside of city noise, I just wanted to really acknowledge the fact that it is very much a different world now. Um, yeah.